welcome you all to this post lunch session after this fine something more aligned to our goals uh, so in this interesting session uh, we've got a variety of speakers from different parts of the globe and um, the basic intent is to understand what different alignments mean we've got different different terminologies we'll have uh, knowledge about what different terminologies mean we'll understand how anatomy affects the alignment we'll also have we'll also understand what is the concept of kinematic alignment we'll talk about what is the new trend with the use of technology the intelligent alignment and finally we'll have a panel discussion on different case scenarios where the alignment approaches can be discussed and dealt with so the first speaker of today is dr mudit khanna i believe so very good afternoon friends thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts today so we'll this is a wonderful symposium on alignment in knee replacement and the topic given to me is digging deeper anatomy and alignment so i i will touch on a very specific aspect in in knee arthroplasty and that is management of the proximal tibia specifically the tibial slope and this is something that um we often see different philosophies there is some ambiguity in how we deal with it there are manufacturer recommendations and there is the classic three finger two finger rule um but are we are we doing justice to you know we 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 speak of very detailed philosophies of alignment we talk about navigation we talk about robotics but conceptually how are we dealing with the tibial slope and are we fitting into the bigger jigsaw puzzle of um you know the uh, philosophies of alignment in a proper way so i just want to share some data that we we published a few years ago on um how we think uh the uh, tibial slope should be managed and so we so i i believe or we believe that the tibial slope should be restored the native anatomical tibial slope should be restored as much as possible within limitations and this would optimize the soft tissue envelop of the knee and would potentially maximize post operative flexion in in ps knee replacements there's a lot of data on PR knee replacements but we published this in PS knees in BJJ uh, some time ago so i just want to share a little bit about the uh, the, the study this is what has been what we all often hear and what we we understand in terms of what we need for good knee function um in the asian context we often require much more knee flexion because of certain cultural requirements and so on and so forth there are a lot of studies that are done on tr knees that have suggested that a higher posterior tibial slope would increase post operative range of movement this is a very busy slide but um i'm not putting it up to go through the nitty gritties in the interest of time but i just want the idea of this is to put up this slide is to to share that there is a huge variation in tibial slopes both the medial lateral posterior tibial slope the medial posterior tibial slope the overall tibial slope as well as medial lateral tibial slope if we if we were to analyze it that way and within the asian context we see certain trends so one of the issues is again are we when we are doing knees in asia we have different thresholds we often need much higher flexion and management of the slope optimally takes on a much greater importance so we had 167 knees with osteoarthritis with 209 primary knee replacements mean age was 66.4 years and this is the demographic distribution typically typically mirroring the singapore population and 6 months post surgery we divided them into three groups sitters kneelers and squatters with the uh, flexion angle of less than 100 degrees for sitters between 100 and 130 degrees for kneelers 
and squatters being able to flex more than 130 degrees. And this is basically showing the measurement of the tibial slope. Um, there are a lot of limitations in this, and this is again something we, which we can discuss. But essentially what we found in this study was that among the sitters or the, the less than 100 degree uh, knee flexion postoperatively at six months, the variation among the tibial slope or the slope change preoperative to postoperatively, the variation among that was the highest. And among those who were squatters, uh, i.e. more than 130 degrees, able to squat, able to kneel, now among this, the variation of slope change was the lowest pre to post operatively. The graphs all intersect at, this, at, this, at a similar point representing the mean, which was pretty much the same for these groups. This again shows it graphically. The frequency distribution of change in tibial slope among squatters, kneelers, and sitters. Um, sitters shows the highest spread. So again, this is showing it numerically. Of course, one of the limitations in the study was lack of CT imaging to measure the posterior tibial slope. And we feel that restoring the native tibial slope rather than cutting it to a predetermined angle might result in better soft tissue balance and a return to normal knee or near normal knee kinematics. Biomechanical studies have shown that a larger posterior slope results in better post-operative range of movement. But, but this also results in a change in the soft tissue balance and envelope of laxity of the knee. So we don't want to trade off some one thing for another. Now, what, we have, what, what, what do other people say? What have other groups seen? Now, again, a lot of the data is in CR knees. And this is another study recently by James et al. And they have also reported that reproduction of the native tibial slope within three degrees resulted in better clinical outcomes manifested by gain in range of motion and knee functional outcome scores. This was their, their main study population was CR knees. We, we looked at PS knees um, and with the endpoint again being restoration of native posterior, posterior tibial slope as much as possible. So in conclusion, restoration of the functional soft tissue envelope of the knee may maximize the flexion angle and range of motion post-operatively in PS TKRs provided coronal alignment has been restored, uh, restored appropriately. So what we are trying to say is that we must, we must move away from a recipe mode of doing things, on following manufacturer's instructions uh, as a formula. We should be understanding patient's anatomy as of the proximal tibia well. And with that, I thank you. Uh, this is my contact number. This is my email. If anybody wants to reach out to me, I have been very mindful to keep on time. Uh, thank you very much once again, and looking forward to catching up with all of you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so um, I think we have a very interesting session today, which is basically on alignment. And my job uh, at the moment is to uh, stick to the very basics, to sort of explain the terms that we commonly use uh, to define alignment so that the lectures that follow make more sense. So I'm just, in short, going to be reviewing um, um, the selected angles and axis uh, that we commonly use to describe lower limb alignment, specifically the ones that are used in recent articles. Define the population mean coronal knee alignment of the most common knee, knee phenotype. And understanding that it's not just the HKA or the degree of deformity that we measure with the hip knee angle, but also the orientation of the joint line, which is extremely important uh, uh, while we assess a preoperative scanogram. And this all will help us understand uh, the variability in individual knee alignments. So coming back to the basics, we know that the mechanical axis is an axis that runs from the center of the hip to the center of the knee. The anatomical axis is along the shaft, and the joint line um, along the uh, articular margins of the distal femur. Now we know that there is an angle of six degrees between the mechanical and the anatomical axis, and that it's about three degrees of slope um, on the distal femur. So we have a joint line which is not perpendicular. We have a joint line that is tilted three degrees in valgus for the femur. 
Uh, there are two angles that are commonly talked about, and uh, there are different nomenclatures used for it. So the more commonly used angle in more recent publications is the femoral mechanical angle, which is essentially the angle between the mechanical axis and the joint line. This helps define the slope, uh, uh, the native slope of the joint line, which is what most people are now trying to focus on and trying to reproduce. Some studies, as you will go through, will rather than using the femoral mechanical angle, end up using the lateral distal femoral angle, which uh, essentially is a similar term because if you draw a line which is 180 degrees, you could measure the medial side, which uh, on an average is 93 degrees plus minus 1.5 degrees, while the LDFA, which is measured on the other side, the lateral distal uh, femur, is 87 degrees. Some studies use ALDFA, which essentially means the anatomical lateral distal femoral angle, which is 81 degrees on an average, and this being because the difference or the angle between the anatomical and the mechanical axis is 6 degrees. So two, uh, two angles that we need to remember when we talk about the distal femur is the femoral mechanical angle or the lateral distal femoral angle. When it comes to the tibia, uh, coming to the basics, uh, the mechanical axis and the anatomical axis of the tibia are typically same. Um, and the joint line makes an angle of 3 degrees of varus. So this is the 3 degrees of varus uh, on the tibial joint line. The two angles that we measure on the tibia are the tibial mechanical angles similar to the, sorry ones, uh, the tibial mechanical angle similar to the femoral mechanical angle, which essentially is the angle between the joint line of the tibia and the anatomical or mechanical axis of the tibia. Some studies would use MPTA rather than using TMA, but for the tibia, because both of them are measured medially, uh, it is essentially the same. So the MPTA and the TMA are two different terms to describe the same sort of angle. While on the femoral side, FMA and LDFA are two different terms uh, and two different angles which can be calculated either wise. The third important thing when we talk about alignment is the joint line convergence angle, which is essentially the angle formed between the distal joint line of the femur and the proximal joint line of the tibia. Normally, uh, these lines are parallel to each other and slope 3 degrees with the apex down. However, if, they, if the joint line uh, opens up, if the joint opens up laterally, there will be an angle created between these two joint lines, which is known as the joint line convergence angle. And it's important to note the joint line convergence angle because the overall alignment of the limb uh, which is the hip knee angle is influenced by the joint line convergence angle. So now moving on to the main angle that we typically tend to measure and we often measure the angle between the mechanical axis of the femur and the mechanical axis or, or the anatomical axis of the tibia. And we often do not take into consideration the joint line convergence angle. So the HKA or the hip knee angle is the sum of the femoral mechanical angle, the FMA, plus the tibial mechanical angle, and the JLCA, which is the joint line convergence angle, typically if it opens up laterally, takes a negative value. So HKA on an, or for a normal phenotype would be, for this particular phenotype would be 93 plus 87 minus 5, so the HKA is 175 which essentially means the patient has a deformity of 5 degrees of varus. Now this is the most common knee phenotype by definition. It has uh, an FMA of 93 degrees, which essentially means the same thing in the sense that the joint line is sloping 3 degrees into valgus for the femur. So the uh, FMA becomes 93 degrees. The tibial mechanical angle of about 87 plus minus 1.5, 87 because again the tibial joint line is sloping 3 degrees into varus, and the JLCA of 0 
because the joint lines are parallel to each other. However, it is extremely important that when we look at a scanogram, we follow the orientation of the joint line. Now, if you look at the image on the right, and if you keep observing the image on the right, you will see that while the hip knee angle is remaining the same, while the hip knee angle is remaining the same, which is indicated by the red line, the joint line orientation is changing from varus or apex down to neutral to apex up. Now, what this is essentially indicating is that you can have a neutral HKA, but you have a different orientation of joint line for different patients. The newer concepts about restoring alignment essentially try to reproduce the native joint line of the patient, and because not restoring the native joint line may account for different kinematics of the joint, and that is why it's extremely important to look at joint lines and not just the hip-knee angle. And just before I end, I just want to sort of show a scanogram, and as we can see, the hip-knee alignment in this particular patient has been restored. The center of the hip, the center of the knee, and the center of the ankle are passing through the, uh, through the, uh, in, 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 uh, in the straight line, and the HKA is 180 degrees. But the joint line has been completely changed in this particular patient from a 3-degree varus. It's about 3 degrees of valgus. Thank you very much. Dr. Vivek Shetty, uh, kinematic alignment, all about being in sync with the anatomy. Good afternoon. <clears throat> so, after the initial introduction on alignment, moving on to why I like the concept of kinematic alignment. So, we've covered normal alignment irrespective of where your leg position remains the line mechanical axis goes through or at least is assumed to go through the center of the knee irrespective of the position of the leg. However, the joint conversion angle changes when you are in your stance phase versus when you are in your gait phase. So then the stance phase, the joint line is sloping medially, but the, when you walk, that becomes parallel. And why is that of importance? We'll kind of have a look. So conventionally, we are familiar that tibia has dominated our technique. We need to cut it at 90 degrees and you try and minimize the tibial cut as much as you can with unintended consequences. So on the tibial side, it changes the orientation of the joint because you just saw it is 87 degrees, you are cutting it in uh, uh, 3 degrees more. It results in over resection laterally and therefore it affects both flexion and extension and which has consequences on the femur. You need to rotate it in three degrees external rotation to compensate for the flexion and under resect on the lateral side in extension to balance. Further consequences, you need, you have a tighter gap and both in flexion and in extension and you have the instrumentation to cope with that. What has happened is our goal to get to the neutral mechanical axis, the NMA, has come out with a successful outcome in the sense that we have a more than 90% survival at 10 degrees. And this is with the uh, better designs have addressed the problem of uh, survival. However, there are various papers who show up to 20 to 25% patients are dissatisfied. Now, when you look, ask our, our colleagues, most of us will say, no, no, I have a much better satisfaction rate. But when you have a patient complaining to you, all that you look at the x-ray and say is well aligned, you go and do more physio. So those, there are quite a bunch of patients who are dissatisfied and we need to look into why, is there anything? And I am not naive enough to say that it is only alignment. There are multifactorial issues, psychological issues and so on. But one of them could be the coronal alignment and it could be the joint line orientation, it could be rotational as well. More and more in this alignment, we do less and less soft tissue release. In fact, I hardly do any soft tissue release in majority of the patients where I do a kinematic alignment. We may need to have a better design and what is the literature evidence of kinematic TKR? So it's something if you have to just look at coronal alignment, let us look at the neutral mechanical axis is going to the center of the knee. 
is not normal because Ekoff's theory says that most of it is on either side. There are quite a lot of outliers. What about the perpendicular joint line? Even that is not uh, known. This is the Ranawat Award paper in 2012 where the slope is in 32%, the joint line is sloping much more than 3 degrees. What about the transepicondylar axis, which is the rotational axis around which the, flex, the tibia flexes and extends? Paper again showing that the transepicondylar axis is not actually the axis, it is the condylar axis which is cylindrical and both the condyles are equal. So the transepicondylar is proximal and anterior. Confirmed again with MRI studies. Again, this is the original author who looked at Howell's, uh, uh, Stephen Howell's paper. So what is the concept in kinematic? The, it's a cylindrical axis in green, which around which the tibia flexes and extends. Slightly proximal and, and anterior, the magenta axis around which the patella flexes and extends. And the tibial rotation axis is in the center, perpendicular to the previous two. Now with Freeman's paper, it's shifted a little medially. So there are more design implications on medial pivot joints for this. Single radius implants are better because J radius may have mid flexion instability. That produces a, 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 a longer lever arm if you have a single radius implant. So single radius is a way to go. What about balancing gaps? It's good to have a good gap in flexion and extension when normally you have three to four millimeters more wider in flexion on the lateral side. Again, the knee pivoting uh, on the medial side with translation on the lateral side is possible only if you have a slightly laxer lateral side. When you flex, we need a little laxity on the lateral side and not an equal flexion extension gap. So our conventional thinking has been that it is a soft tissue procedure, you place the implant at the correct place and then work on the soft tissues. So we have now, it's time to look at a newer concept where it is shown that tibia and varus doesn't fail us and the depth of tibia cut is not as significant. So that is the concept in kinematic. What if you place the implant where it is meant to be and the axis is where we describe the axis. And the expectation is if you place it there, you may get a better functional outcome. As based on the cartilage thickness. So if you have a wear, where is bone on bone, the cartilage is worn about 2 to 3 millimeters. Knowing that, can we proceed with the uh, a surgery by measuring the, each of the cut and then presuming where to place your components. So a case example in, is what I do mo in about 90% of the cases where I can predict the wear, this is what I would do. That's the cut. So that's bone on bone on the medial side is typically what you would see. I have my distal cut which is uh, uh, decided I have a 2 millimeter plate which uh, distalizes the distal resection guide independent of the varus valgus angle. I measure that. So if it's on the medial side I have a resection of 6 millimeter, 2 millimeter for the wear, 1 millimeter for the thickness of the cartilage that is 9, 8 on the non worn side plus 1 millimeter for the thickness of the cartilage of the saw. That's 9 millimeter. My distal thickness of the implant is 9 and the vanguard knee and the posterior is 9. So then I go on to me uh, measure that. Then get a, uh, my posterior referencing guide to me measure the AP sizing with zero, 0 degrees rotation. Remember there's no 3 degrees rotation here. And I get my posterior cuts, 8 and 8 millimeters. So that is equivalent to the 9 millimeter thickness of my implant. So my femur is now mechan uh, kinematically aligned, 9 and 9. So now all that I need to do, this is a challenging part, do a tibial cut so that I match the flexion and the extension gap, but with a difference. It is no play in extension, but there is a little opening on the lateral side on flexion, which is what I want. And because you have cut the tibia slightly in varus, you will get that play on the lateral side. So that's the tibial rotation marked. In the sagittal plane, we had a talk on the tibial slope. We, I may have an anterior posterior offset measurement and whatever the reading is, I want it to be 2 millimeter less because I have distalized by 2 millimeter the more medial worn side. So that's the standard implantation and that's my working sheet. So that's the X-ray. Now the first reaction is the tibia is in varus and which is where the joint line is sloping nicely medially and posteriorly there's no offset. So some of the cases I started off with a straightforward cases, some severe varus cases 
and that's the Oxford knee score at uh, six months. They have a very natural knee range of movement. And in a much more severe, again, I have drawn the mechanical axis for a deliberate reason. Some of us might say, okay, that is in hugely medial. But that patient at four years has an OXO score of 42 out of 48, which is a good score. This is a case where I did a mechanical and a kinematic. She says the kinematic anecdotally, she says it's better. The joint line slope, you can clearly see. And TKR in a valgus knee, again, I don't kind of worry where the mechanical axis lands. This is a, in a valgus knee, that's where the axis lands, but a knee functions normally. If there is an implant proximally, I don't worry about it because my intermediary rod is not measuring any angle. It is just as a stand to get my distal jig in so that I can put the implant in. I don't need a navigation for that. So evidence in between neutral mechanical axis and kinematic, no difference. They are functionally the same. But patients prefer the kinematic. They feel more comfortable with that. But they, none of them complained about a slight virus in their knees. They were quite okay. And the same has been in my practice. None of them say that you've left my knee in too much virus or valgus. Restoration of the joint line is the most uh, patient reported outcome where you can say predict the outcome. Just closing up, again, lateral opening up inflection has been shown to be giving a better functional outcome. So survival, long-term survival by the designer author, 10 years at 98%. So kinematic al alignment allow, makes us a little concerned because you're putting the joint line in varus. The femoral joint line is in valgus. The normal knee posterior condylar axis is in internal rotation. So these are all the challenges and concerns. What it has made us definitely think of is alignment in the coronal plane, but we need to think about axial as well as the sagittal plane. It has come up with new terminologies, the restricted kinematic, the functional alignment, the adjusted mechanical, and now the intelligent alignment as well with the robot coming in picture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. I would like to invite Dr. Vaibhav Bagaria to his talk on intelligent alignment, best of all, both the worlds. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, uh, the previous speakers, for making my task easier. So we come to the era of intelligence. Uh, we have all been intelligent, but let's see how technology influences us. We have known that the mechanical goals of TKR are to restore alignment, preserve or restore the joint line, balance the knee properly, precise component alignment, and patellofemoral tracking. So no amount of uh, playing around with this. If we do this, I think we'll have a great PROM and great survivorship. We do have additional goals in terms of surgical time, decrease in infection, reducing pain, reducing stay, having a happy team, and being cost effective. The key techniques when we do a TKR is to have a good alignment, good balance, cuts should be appropriate, sizing should be good, good cementing and good closure. So where does the intelligence comes in? And I think the intelligence is the ability to change. I think we have been changing over the years. This used to be the standard thing. And in all conferences, the debate used to be orthoplastic, whether CR is good or PS is good, whether the mechanical alignment is better than kinematic alignment, who needs technology, whether it's required or I am the great. It was always about who is the greatest of all time, who is the messy. But I think it's time to introspect because I think we have changed and so the orthoplasty too should change. And again, you'll see throughout the thing, there are, despite all the things, uh, the results have not been shown to be clinically different in various registries. You'll see some people talking about kinematics, mechanical, it will keep changing as time goes by. And true enough, we know that these philosophies have changed, mechanical alignment, kinematic alignment, and as uh, we discuss right now, the important part of gap that there should be slight opening on the lateral, especially in degrees of flexion. Now what is important, and I think this is the most important slide. Uh, we, need, we have been told to be accurate and precise, but some of us are very good surgeons. We are very precise in executing things, but we don't know where to hit the ball. So they are accu not accurate, but precise. And then there are some of us who know where to go, but they are not accurate. So this is accurate and not precise. And there are few of us, when we start, we are neither accurate nor precise. And then once you have achieved the level of accuracy and precise, you are told that the targets are not the same and that they keep moving. That's where the intelligence lies. And I think understanding this 
will end the alphabet soup because it's different. It's different for each of our patients. And I think technology allows us to do that. And that's why we have changed from 1970s of mechanical alignment, anatomical alignment, kinematic alignment, constitutional alignment, adjusted mechanical alignment, restricted kinematic alignment. And everyone seems to claim that they have done the best. And why is that, why is that claim there? Because they have done best. But there are certain outliers. And why are the outliers there? Because we do not understand that there is a certain set of population, the needs are different, the anatomy is different, and these are the patients that you can identify with technology, and that's where the concept of intelligent alignment, where the surgeon's intelligence, not the artificial intelligence, but the surgeon's intelligent expertise and the robotic intelligence comes in play. As an arthroplasty surgeon, we need to understand that we need to play with soft tissue. Of course, the TKR started as being a soft tissue surgery, but where can we tweak? We can tweak in six degree of freedom of each component. We can place component in varus valgus flexion extension and rotate the components. And we can translate the component medially, laterally, anterior, posterior, proximal, distally. Together we can have almost 1000 permutation combinations. And if you can reach out of these 1000, the top 10, you have done your job. And that top 10 should be the patient specific alignment. So the intelligent alignment, what is intelligent alignment? Understanding that the goal is not same for everyone. Use the technology to hit the moving target, which is different for each person. And how do you do that? You set certain negotiables and certain non-negotiable. To make our job easy, we need to know what I am willing to give and what I am not willing to give. The key goal is to balance forces all across the joint. If you are able to achieve that, your patient will be happy no matter what the X-ray so shows. So for me, what is non-negotiable? I will, my alignment philosophy is that I'll accept up to five degree of varus and two degree of valgus. This is what robotic has taught me. So this is the range that it gives me. I want my balance in medial lateral to be two millimeter in either thing. Gaps in flexion extension, I expect either equal gap or if I'm doing a male patient specifically, and again, this is patient specific, experience specific. Male patients who have got higher size, I leave them loose in extension when I am doing a total. And I leave my, uh, UKRs a little bit loose in flexion. Again, experience different from different people, different for perhaps for different races. I don't want any notching. I don't want overhangs in femur and tibia, and I want to preserve joint lines. So these are the non-negotiable that I have. But it also gives me certain scope for negotiating with things. And what do I negotiate? I negotiate with positioning my femur in AP. I move them up and down. I can change my rotation up to five degrees of external rotation instead of three, and two degrees of internal rotation. I can give varus valgus in each component up to three degrees, but not more than five degrees of total. Most of them are less than three degrees. And I can change, as Dr. Gurpal said, tibial slope up to five degrees. And I can most importantly change my implant one or uh, size up and down. So between the negotiable and non-negotiable, I still have 300 permutation combination to play. And that's what is intelligent alignment, my friends. So if you look at my happiness score, if the end of the surgery, if my alignment is between zero to two degree varus, if my balance is less than two millimeters, if my components are adequately aligned and positioned, and I have to do minimal release, I'm the happiest. I have delivered what I was mandated for. I'm okay if I've still edged on some amount of alignment variation, some amount of medial lateral gap opening, and did a moderate release. And I'm unhappy if I have neither achieved my alignment, my component positioning, or I have to do a significant release. So the happiest patient will be in the first group, in my opinion. The second group will do reasonably okay, and the third will do the worst. Some case, and how do we all do that? It's with robotic. So I think we'll have a workshop and we'll detail, we'll have a detailed discussion because of paucity of time. I will not go, but you'll just see that how we can assess the balance real time with this. So this is a screen where the robot gives you how much is the tightness, looseness, and how you just have a look at the four screens, how real time you can change it to balance. So always balance on the good side. So you'll see that I'll do that to achieve the lateral balance and I said, and then if you com accomplish the case, your medial lateral opening is same throughout the range. Again, another case similar, this is one of the things that's happening in real time. Those of you who are interested can do a complete workshop tonight, today at 5.30 in Hall D. You'll see that how I'm changing it real time to uh, and tweaking the sizes, tweaking the variations, to tweaking the angles on how to do this. So this is the stress range of motions, unstressed and stressed range of movement, giving you a real time picture of how things are. So once that's done, it gives you a sort of a picture of 
how the gaps will look. So this is the gap and then you'll see with time how I'm changing each of the component in slight degree of virus. The femur is being changed. Then the tibia again I put one degree virus. I'll probably change the poly size now. So all of these things can be done real time to ensure that the things are in place. Again, another case, but we'll skip this. So in end, I said, we need to identify the bullseye. As we move with our skill and experience, this is where I used to be. For most of my knees, I used to be in slightly varus, slightly tight medially compared to the laterally. But today, I think with technology, I've reached more closer to bullseye, although there is still some tightness for most of my varus knees. In conclusion, I would just say that we must avoid extensive ligament release in today's world. Know where we want to go. Targets are not the same for all the patient. We need to learn the art of science, art and science of negotiable and non-negotiable. And of course, with technology, you can execute it to precision with robotic technology. We must master the technology and not become its slave. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Weibo. Uh, any questions regarding the talks? Uh, the question to Mr. Gurpal Singh, but I think not there, so we can ask others. Uh, he was saying that uh, we had to reproduce the tibial slope. Uh, at the same time, he was using a PS type of implant. I think we uh, assume uh, in PS, I think we cannot go more than five degree, five degree of slope because cam and post impingement. That's, uh, that was something which was uh, which I didn't understand very well. Like, but so, again. Uh, uh, explain more on this. Did you understand uh, how they measure the post-operative slope from the X-rays? But uh, I didn't understand. Tibia, tibia, and tibia. no, no. They measure the post-operative uh, slope on the X-rays. Short films, we don't know. So uh, when you are doing a uh, posterior cut, out of time you aim for three, but you are cutting in neutral or even sometimes reverse. So uh, because the bone is sclerosed in the posterior aspect, that's where the maximum osteoarthritis is happening. So you might aim for zero, you might be cutting in zero, I mean uh, aim for three but cutting in zero. So those patients will lose flexion. If you are aiming for three and you are able to reproduce three, slope is maintained. Uh, five is ideal for our patients, most of our Indian patients, slope is five. So I always aim for five, either I land up in three or five. So the range of movements is there. If you are cutting zero, then again you lose slope, lose flexion. Typically. Trying to reproduce the patient. But and I couldn't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was he able to reproduce without a yeah. uh, uh, CR? It is uh, okay. Yeah. We can have more slope. Yes, it. Was. That's what I don't know. What uh, he did conventional or uh, robotic assisted? Unless you reproduce what you are aiming for, it's not possible to get your results. If he's aiming for three and he's able to reproduce three, or aiming for five and reproducing five, then he's getting a good uh, slope. That is understood. So aiming for five and cutting zero, and then is get not getting flexion. It is. So what you aim, you should be able to execute, otherwise your results are going to be uh, uh, biased. So uh, Mohan, the only checkpoint that I have is I attended Stephen Howell for two days uh, demonstration of surgery, he has an anterior posterior offset measurement. So in a CR knee now, so the anterior posterior offset measurement, whatever the reading, once you distalize the medial side by 2 millimeters, he wants that distance. So if it is 20, he wants it to come down to 18 in the plane. If it is not, he increases the posterior slope. So that is one way that intraoperatively he gets a feedback with the anterior posterior caliper measurement. But otherwise, without robotic technology, I don't think you would be able to kind of execute that accurate uh, so for slope. PS, uh, who all does PS, how do, what is the slope you aim for? Uh, Dr. Sachin, do you use CS? So PS? I think yes, I use you know, equal PS and CR and we aim for three, but what you said is absolutely right. Uh, when you're using conventional instruments, you end up usually with a slope that is less than what you achieve. So uh, I think what's really important to understand is that uh, when you're using conventional instruments, one of the important things is that we pay very less time on adjustment of the tibial jig, which I feel is probably the most critical part of the whole, uh, whole procedure. And uh, do you uh, check your flexion gap tightness before you uh, commit to your component size slope, final slope? Absolutely. So if you feel uh, it is three and you are tight on flexion, yeah. do you increase the slope? Absolutely. So that also has to be done. You cannot go with a fixed slope. Absolutely. Yeah. So everything is a combination of multiple things. You cannot have a fixed slope for a particular design. That's what he concluded not go with the fixed uh, implant recommendation and the fixed plan for a particular patient. It's highly variable. Yes. 
Okay, I have a question to the panel. Do you all try and reproduce the posterior tibial slope in your knees, whichever implant you use, whichever level of constraint you use? That's question number one. And as per Dr. Gurpal's talk, I am quoting three different talks, uh, three different publications which I just siffled through uh, while I was hearing that talk. One talks of a native tibial slope variation from minus 5 to 21. The other talks of a native tibial slope of 6 to 24 degrees. The other talks of a variation of tibial slope from 5 to 17 degrees. Now what kind of restoration of the anatomical tibial slope are you talking of? So I think, uh, you know, uh, we'll put across the panel. I think Mudit, you gave a talk on uh, looking at various measurements. And um, so, you know, why don't you come out with your answer is that, yes, there is huge variation within normal anatomy. So what sort of anatomical landmarks do you choose? Because normal anatomical landmarks and the anatomy when you replace a joint are completely two different things, which is what we need to understand. To try and put in a tibial um, component at 20 degree slope because the patient had a 20 degree slope, I think would be a recipe for disaster. Yes, Mudit, your... Yeah, so I think that reproduce, I mean, so let's understand uh, two things first. One, that I think the, the parameter that is extremely difficult to sort of target and reproduce and even assess intraoperatively is the tibial slope itself. Even when we're using uh, uh, sort of assisted technology, uh, I use, I do my knees computer navigated. I think the, it's, it's extremely reliable when you look at virus valgus, but it's not as reliable when you look at the slope itself. So I think um, the best way in terms of what we want to reproduce, yes, we want to get as close to the uh, uh, native slope that that particular patient has. Uh, how do we do it? I think it's a combination of what happens intraoperatively. We, we, we take a certain target and uh, based on that target, we take our cuts. We check on the cut surface uh, to give us a fair amount of idea whether we've got uh, the slope correct or almost correct or not. And then secondly, when we assess our flexion and we see how the knee is flexing, assess the stability during flexion, we then can take a decision of whether we want to increase the slope or not. Now here is where technology helps. So let me, I'm just trying to stress a point that initially the slope may or may not be correctly predicted when you use, um, you know, computer assisted technology or robotics. But if you want to enhance the slope by two degrees, that relative increase in the slope can be very, very precisely predicted when you use technology, which is not possible with mechanical instrumentation. Okay. So I think, you know, I want to ask one question to the panel as well as the delegates. Um, mechanical alignment still works, correct? And it is still the gold standard. So are we now resorting to restricted kinematic alignment and trying to look at newer tech, newer alignment methodologies because we want to sell technology because you see a huge amount of publication that has come out stressing the need that you know kinematic alignment has to be there you have to put it with five degrees of virus minimal soft tissue releases and all of this has come out for the last four or five years once robotics you know was really became very popular so are we looking at more of commercial aspects or is it real science that has really transformed in the last five years more and i'll get you to answer that can I? <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is nothing to do with, do with the robotics because Stephen Howell, who popularized this uh, kinematic alignment technique, actually did not use any robotic. No, uh, this thing. He in fact used the caliper. The book on that caliper measured. I think he's uh, he spoke on, uh, and they put in an algorithm and see like, basically equal cuts as much is almost like a measured dissection Correct. and uh, CR. So no. Uh, uh, no uh, robotics is required. Correct. Uh, to add to this my comment, I would like to ask Dr. Uh, Vivek that do you ever use intramediary jig because you do while using kinematic because you just have to take cuts parallel to the surfaces and as much as the thickness of the uh, prosthesis. So do you use the cut uh, jigs at all or you don't intramediary jigs for the femur? 
We don't use. I I I don't have robotics. I I don't have computer navigation. Are you using uh, intramedullary? So I am using jig? a intramedullary rod in the femur yes. as a stand to put my distal femoral jig. But you don't use the. Angle. You don't use I don't angle. use it as an angle. angle. The only thing I like about this is the only instrument that I get from Vanguard Biomet where the distal resection is independent of the varus valgus change that I can make. Yeah. So that is the only reason that is the only reason I have taken up kinematic, otherwise I would have to do a robotic uh, kinematic. Yeah. So to answer the question, I think Com commerce does is a uh, commercial yeah. aspect is is in play as well yeah but there is a lot of allegiance still to the neutral mechanical axis that's Absolutely. why you have the restricted kinematic in Correct. play because people are not comfortable to put it out of the zone as the original designer has done yeah yes question yeah uh, dr ashit Shah from bombay so the question to the, all the panelists we have been mechanically aligning the knees and we have about 85 percent of our patient satisfaction rate now, using the technology and this different kind of alignments, have we got any proof or any evidence which makes this figure of 15% less? So what I mean to say is whether we have more success by using this technology and this different kind of complicated uh, sort of alignments. Akash, you take that question. You haven't spoken. So, um, that's a very valid question that only if it is uh, converting to clinical outcome, then it makes sense to do all these things. Uh, most of us who are doing robotics, I don't think uh, most of us are not doing the true mechanical alignment anymore. Most of us are adjusting it by few degree of varus anyway in order to soft tissue balancing it. So I think we have moved more, to, more towards soft tissue balancing as a more important criteria by probably compromising or adjusting the alignment. Whether or not any reports have said, I don't, I don't find any Indian literature as yet to uh, say about uh, reducing that patient satisfaction. Definitely there are many articles from US already which talk about better patient outcomes with the robotic where there is more accuracy of uh, alignment. In, in terms of percentage, I'm asking whether there, there are reports of the kinematic by Stephen Howell and Wendy Tolley has uh, pro uh, proposed the restricted kinematic. Basically, the pain is also because of the soft tissue releases which are required. So, as regards the survival, mechanical alignment and uh, the kinematic alignment or restricted kinematic have almost no, we have 10 year uh, survival results and they are There's equal. There is no difference. There is no difference. No difference. In, uh, equivalence, not better, but equivalence. But as regards the soft tissue releases which are required, we, we create a skewed alignment in the mechanical which is not there. So we have to release more when we are doing mechanical which is not there. So it is logically speaking that mechanic, the pain relief uh, as regards in the kinematic is less, uh, more, sorry, I'm sorry, more as compared to the mechanical alignment. One last quick comment before we close. Yes. Uh, we have a paper on under correction in virus deformities published. So patients uh, who had severe virus, uh, we had two groups, one is undercorrected, one we corrected to neutral mechanical axis. The undercorrected patients recovered faster and they are feeling better. But end of one year, both were equal. So yeah. if you undercorrect, definitely they are feeling better. So the patient satisfaction is better, but end of one year, it, everything becomes equal. So look at long term data, I think the difference will come down. So we said uh, maybe a little bit undercorrection is okay, but try to get it to the neutral alignment. Thank you. Thank you. I thank all the panelists. The technology that was asked, just, I would just give it as an analogy of driving a car. You know what's the most important thing that when you drive a car? It's the destination you want to reach. No amount of technology will tell you where to go. I think as long as we understand that we are the one who are driving where to go, it's only the data that will tell you which is the best route to go. If you have navigation, you can get a route. You can have the best cars, you can have an autonomous car. But the decision where to go will never be technology. So I think what we are debating is the data that technology gives. We have to decide where to go and what's more appropriate based on the data that technology provides. So I think technology will keep impacting every aspect and good, good uh, product makes good economics and they'll, they'll be the only one that will last. Thank you. Thank you for all the panelists for the excellent session. Uh, thank you.